today we join two specialists to talk about this terrible disease called Alzheimer. They come from Israel, from Hamirkas Harefui Israeli Alzheimer, the Israeli Medical Center for Alzheimer's Disease, a non-lucrative institution that is funded by donations. With us, Professor Michelle Davidson, Chairman of the Medical Center, and Nitai Elias, CEO. Both will visit Mexico on November 1st and 2nd to be in the Feria de Salud at our Mount Sinai community. Uh, first, welcome you both, and it's an honor to have this interview with us at Enlace Judío. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start with uh, Professor Davidson. Professor Israel is a worldwide pioneer in medical investigation. So uh, what is Israel doing now in the field of Alzheimer's disease? And will there ever be a cure for Alzheimer's? To cure or ameliorate Alzheimer's and or dementia? We would like first maybe to ask you what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? The difference, dementia is what you see clinically, meaning when you see a person, generally an elderly person who doesn't remember, is disoriented, has poor judgment, saying this person is probably demented. Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's disease when, you, when you refer to Alzheimer's disease, you refer to a person who during life was demented and a post-mortem examination meaning when you hold his brain after his death in your hand, you see a particular type of lesion which was described by Alois Alzheimer, a neuropathist, psychiatrist, about a hundred years ago working in Germany. So one is a dementia clinical picture. Alzheimer is a particular type of dementia whose histological characteristic were described. One can have dementia for other reason in addition to Alzheimer's, but Alzheimer is the most common type of dementia. What is Israel doing in the field of Alzheimer? And if there is uh, any, there will ever be a cure or uh, a real treatment for, or a drug for Alzheimer? Most probably there is not going to be an absolute cure to Alzheimer's disease. Like every complex multifactorial disease, there will be solutions, there will be an amelioration, there will be specific treatment of symptoms, but there will not be an absolute solution to Alzheimer's disease the way an antibiotic treats an infection mm -hmm. or a vaccine prevents a disease. And the reason is because different from what we believed 25, 30 years ago, that Alzheimer's is a single reason, probably dementia being demented derives from many reasons which interact in an additive way among themselves. So we will be able to cure some of the contributors to Alzheimer's disease, but probably not all of them. In a way, to give you a parallel that is easier to understand, if you would ask me, is there such a thing like a cure to cancer? And the answer is yes and no. If you look 20, 40 years ago, there was absolutely no cure to cancer. If you look nowadays, we can cure or ameliorate a lot of cancers. Most probably 20 years from now, we'll be able to cure or ameliorate many more cancers. Nevertheless, there will still be some cancers that we will not be able to cure. So most probably the situation with Alzheimer's disease is going to be the same. We are not such an advanced 
is an advanced stage as we are with Alzheimer's disease, because understanding how cells multiply in cancer is much easier than understanding how the brain functions. Therefore, the way to, to ameliorate Alzheimer's is so slow, because just understanding the normal functioning of the brain is so difficult. Like in many, like in many advanced countries, Israel is very much involved in the research, in neuroscience research in general, meaning trying to understand our normal brain functions and specifically in Alzheimer's disease. Probably one of the most promising pieces of research is being done in Israel at the Weizmann Institute by a researcher called Michal Schwartz. She's a very famous, if you do a search, she publishes very often in Nature and Science. And I will tell you in a moment what is the general trend of research and how her research is different and pioneering. For the last, let me go back to 1980, 1990s. In the 1980s, 1990s, the community of scientists believed that people get demented, get Alzheimer's disease, get demented, because there's a particular neurotransmitter in the brain called acetylcholine is missing, is being depleted. And what the pharmaceutical industry did, they devised compounds, they devised compounds which increase the availability of this neurotransmitter to the synaptic plate, to the brain. It mm -hmm. turns out that that was true only partially, and the drugs which are available now, approved by all the regulatory, uh, regulatory bodies and available in Mexico, I know it for a fact, increase the availability of acetylcholine, but only affect the disease itself only marginally, marginally, marginally. Just a little bit slow down the progression of the disease. The next step was the ability to visualize in patients, in vivo, not at post-mortem, in vivo, the protein, the deposits, in the brain tissue described by Alzheimer's called amyloid. We are able to visualize it to, to do a, what is called a positron emission tomography and see. So the next step was for the pharmaceutical industry and people in, in academia and research to devise antibodies which go into the brain and attack this particular protein, which was believed until recently to be pathogenic for the brain tissue, and hopefully to, to improve Alzheimer's disease. It turns out that the antibodies against amyloid indeed are able to decrease the amount of this protein, but not to improve symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Many, many billions of dollars were spent to devise those antibodies and to execute the trials. But it turns out that it doesn't really help. Biologically, it produces what it's supposed to produce, but it doesn't help. Because most probably, this protein, this amyloid, is only a bystander or what we call a biological marker, but not the cause of the disease. Again, as I told you at the beginning, probably the cause of the disease is multifactorial. Meaning many, many things happen in the brain, and the end result of it is that people get demented. What is pioneering and interesting about this Israeli research, Hal Schwartz research, is that her approach 
is trying to address a number of reasons that may be involved in causing Alzheimer's disease. The research basically is saying if we argument if we increase the, the um, process, which is the immune process, which fights the derbits in the brain, if we introduce cells, immune active cells into the brain, we may improve the disease. At this point, we don't know whether she's correct or not, in rats, in laboratory animals, it works wonderful, but many things work wonderful in laboratory animals, but not in people. Unfortunately, our brain is much more sophisticated than a rat brain. Not everybody's, some people's <laughs> brain. Anyway, so I think I answer what is being done in this way. In your website, you talk about a key factor for, for every one of us. It is dignity, human dignity. And um, uh, how to preserve human dignity when you are a victim of Alzheimer's? I think this is terrible. This, this is a major issue. And let me start, it's, it's a major issue. You are coming up with a very relevant point. To start with, you should talk to those people, to people affected, as if they don't have Alzheimer's. They don't, don't assume, don't, as if they don't have the disease. Meaning, talk to them as if they are healthy, normal people. Don't try to infantilize them and talk to them as if they are children who don't understand, even if they don't understand, you should talk to them as if they are a normal person. And if you see that they don't understand, elaborate on what you try to say, but don't talk to them as if there are children or, or, or retarded or whatever. That has two effects. It has an effect on them directly trying to, to project dignity, but it, is, it also has an effect on you, the person who, the interlocutor, the person who talks to them, because it, it forces you to relate to them as if there are real people. This is one thing. The other thing has to do, again, with activities. Try to organize for them activities which are fitted to their abilities. The third thing is, of course, make sure that they are clean, they are well fed, and the more difficult thing is that they are not in pain. Many times, an individual who is demented may suffer pain for whatever reason, but not being able to express it. So it's they express it many times as yelling, screaming, being agitated. So don't take it for granted that people with dementia are agitated just because. Sometimes they're agitated because they're uncomfortable or in pain for a reason that you are not aware. So this is something else to be aware in terms of dignity. This is more or less what I have to say. Uh, sometimes we uh, forget our keys, we forget a name, we forget an address, and we start thinking, I may have Alzheimer's. What are the symptoms we have to be aware of and uh, how to diagnose it? I see many people in the Alzheimer's Center, I see people who come to the center from outside in the community. And at least a third of them are people, mostly elderly, who are anxious that they're about to get the disease because they forgot their keys, they forgot where they parked the car, they forgot something. 
this is absolutely normal. I mean, two things are normal. One, it's normal to forget things, particularly- Because lately we have so much information that- uh, Exactly. Particularly when you're trying to do a lot of things at the same time, you're trying to interview somebody, you're trying to write an article, you're trying to take care of your children, elderly, elderly parents, whatever. So you, you, you're trying to do many, many things at the same time and you forget some of them, this is one. Second, as a normal process of going through life, one's memory becomes less than that as good. Meaning, yourself or myself have better memory when, you're, when we were 18 and better memory when we were 28, 38, 48, 58. But there is a continuous lifelong decline in memory. So it's normal that when you are 60, 70, 80, 90, you can be perfectly healthy and still have a significant decline in memory. This is part of getting old. The same way as I assume you and everybody else are able to run slower than you are able when you are 18. I guess you are 20 by now, right? You are more than 18. More or less. So, <laughs> so I guess, so I guess you are able to run slower than you are running when you are 18. The same thing. As you go through life, you are able to, to remember less. You are able to come up with words more difficult. This is normal aging. So losing your keys doesn't mean that you, you are becoming demented. If you put your kids in your refrigerator, you should be worried. <laughs> really? People put the keys in the refrigerator? No, no, I just, I was joking. <laughs> uh, okay. If you make, well, I'm, I'm trying to say, I'm trying to say, 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 misplacing something, losing something has nothing to do with dementia. Doing things that are grossly, that grossly show to the judgment, it's a sign that you should, should be considered as dementia. So, Misplacing your key is normal. Putting them in your freezer is less normal. And can we do something to uh, reduce the risk of dementia? The same way is, is we do a lot of things to reduce risk of heart disease and to reduce risk of uh, risk of uh, cancer. Risk of Many diseases, yes, we can decrease risk of thermal disease. Uh, turns out, first of all, that all the risk for cardiovascular disease are also risk for Alzheimer's disease. So keeping our cholesterol level in check, keeping our blood pressure in check, uh, keeping our weight in check, meaning not getting, not getting, not gaining too much weight, uh, being active physically uh, decreases the risk for Alzheimer's disease. So everything you do to decrease your risk for cardiovascular disease also decreases your risk for Alzheimer's disease. There are many, many, many other things that come up from time to time in the literature, but, but they are questionable. There is such a thing like in epidemiology, like intervening or intermediate factors. I'll give you an example. So the publication in scientific journals recently said having cataract surgery decreases your risk for Alzheimer's. So it's an other, um, there was an other uh, publication in a specialty journal said if you are hard of hearing, and a lot of elderly people are hard of hearing, having a, a hearing device, you know, a, a hearing device that helps you hearing, 
reduces the risk of Alzheimer's and on and on and on. However, however, there is always an intermediate factors that people from higher socioeconomical status who take care of their illnesses better than people, than less educated people from lower socioeconomic status are healthier. So it is more likely that you, you will use a hearing device or you will have a cataract surgery if you belong to a more educated, higher socioeconomic strata, which is an intermediate factor which lowers the risk for Alzheimer's disease. You, you understand what I'm trying to say? Yes, yes, so, yes. There, are, there are a lot of factors that, that lower the risk for Alzheimer's disease. Are they, do they directly lower the risk or is there another factor that lowers the risk? Um, it's hard to say. For the moment, what is unequivocal is that risk fact, cardiovascular risk factors lower the risk for Alzheimer's disease. Let me jump to a question that I guess you are about to ask. Does, does intellectual activity when you are elder, you know, doing things, reading books, going to movies, whatever, Doing crosswords. Say it again. Do it, doing crosswords or... Uh... Doing crosswords, right. Lower the risk for Alzheimer's. And the answer is, again, this is the case of reverse casualty on one hand, meaning you go to movies, you, 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 you do crosswords, and whatever, because you are not demented. It's not that you, you don't become demented. It's, it's a reverse casualty. This is one explanation. The other explanation, it turns out, and there is data on it, I can explain it. Data, but said what really helps you is not what you do when you are old, but the, the brain reserve you come to at old age. In other words, the kind of brains that help you become a journalist and, and I mean, and go sorry, go to school in the first place and go to journalist school and then maintain your job and on and on. This is your brain reserve. This is what reduces the risk. Nitai, uh, how was the medical center established and what's its vision? It's uh, established, it's open in 2001 in Israel, but it's think, you know, always it's, there is a couple of years before. So I think it's, uh, all the development, you know, the money, the people to organize everything, it started everything in two, two, 1994, around. Uh, my grandmother had the Alzheimer and my dad wanted to find a good solution for people with Alzheimer disease in Israel and also in the world. So they, developed, they donated money and also, you know, another client of my dad, another couple of organizations that donate money to arrange this kind of facility or, uh, or hospital. And each time it's become, in the beginning, it was a, a building for uh, 4,000 square meters. And now uh, we have around 19,000 square meters. So each time we developed and we began become bigger. And the vision is, I hope that people are not going to need us, but uh, as Professor Davidson said before, life expectancy is growing and people live longer and the problems become more often and, uh, and, and the mind and uh, you know, problem with memories is always hard. So, uh, I hope that people are not going to use this, but for, if you ask me, our vision is to help the community, to help people, to help the families, uh, to know about uh, the, the Alzheimer, to know what we can do, what people should do. And this is uh, our vision. 
Okay, uh, what are the departments operating in the medical center? How is it? The strong? idea, I understand, the idea is uh, to help in all the stage of the of the illness. I mean, in the beginning, if we can help at home, you know, to, to give uh, through the call center, we have a call center that open 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, to help the patient, the family. We have also uh, um, organized also to give service at home. Here in Israel, we can send somebody, a doctor, a nurse, or something to your home. And then if there is also, you need already a doctor to, to see or to have a, you know, a, a test or something, they can come here to the clinic. And after they can also get hospitalized, short term, long term, uh, you know, the, it's the, and to help all the stages till the end of the, the, of the you know, the recycle. This is the idea. I have to tell you that we have also a very unique, I think, uh, relationship with uh, Mexican community, Jewish community. For us, it's very important. And we have also uh, helped people in the community through our Zoom, you know, with our doctors, uh, you know, all kind of um, meetings to check the appeals, to check, you know, to help the family what to do and not what what not to do, uh, and I have a couple of people in Mexico that they enjoy it very much. For another second opinion, you know, somebody that can help them. Uh, you saw uh, Professor Michael Davidson, so they can you know talk to see. Uh, so this is very important for us. So someone can uh, can call you and ask for a consultation or uh, maybe uh, some uh, what yeah 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 the, if, if, uh, here in Israel for sure through Mexico I, it's not a problem I think it's better to like to make an appointment through the internet or then like uh, to send a mail and to arrange a meeting with, a, with an hour and to know if it's a person that knows English, Hebrew or uh, Spanish because we can help all, all kinds. So, so, but I think uh, it's easier to arrange a meeting and then because, you know, uh, the hours is something else and we need to know before what exactly they want us uh, you know, maybe to get uh, yeah. all kind of documents before. So this is uh, the idea. I see. As uh, we know, there are plans for a big Alzheimer center in Beersheba. How are these plans uh, uh, developing? I don't know. In Mexico, people say that everything is developed very quickly. Here in Israel, it's uh, the idea, we get the, the land. Now we are, you know, starting all the, the structure. But I think in another four, five years, is going to be open a new facility. I, I'm not sure uh, big like here in Ramat Gan, uh, but uh, not so small. We are thinking about seven uh, departments because in Beersheba is very grown and it's going to be bigger. And all the army is moving to Beersheba uh, and I hope it's going to be a nice facility. Well, thank you so much, Isai. Thank me, Tai. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And I hope that I'm going to see you in Mexico. I hope so. I will be there. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.